While you are turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, that'll be our text for today. I'll uh, just let you know the, the, uh, the announcement that I failed to make. Sunday school begins next week. Okay, so Sunday school for all of the uh, age groups. Everything's back to normal next Sunday morning. Same time, same Sunday school channel. So that's next Sunday, Sunday school. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. The Apostle Paul has um, this uh, writing to the Corinthians and uh, in this chapter he explains how that his ministry and uh, that of his fellow ministers had been approved, had been approved of God. In fact, in verse 3, he says, Giving no offence in anything, that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labours, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armour of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honour and dishonour, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying, behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. And I've been working my way through that list. And uh, so I'm just going to finish that list off this morning. But before I do, can we just come before the Lord and ask him to bless the preaching. Father, we do thank you that we have the, the, the word of God and that we're able to come every Lord's Day and open it up and we're able to understand uh, what it is you want us to do and how you want us to live. And Father, I pray that as we look through these uh, these various qualities that the Apostle Paul assigned his own ministry, I pray that, Father, it might challenge us uh, concerning, uh, Lord, whether we are indeed serving the Lord and to the nature of our ministry, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been conducting a series in 2 Corinthians, as I said, <clears throat> and Paul has come up to the place where uh, he <clears throat> tells a uh, the Corinthians, that he and his fellow workers had approved themselves as the ministers of God. That's what he said in verse 4. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. And then he went on and listed 28 ways that they had approved themselves as the ministers of God. He and his ministry team, if you like, had, the, had received the tick of approval in all 28 areas of their ministry. The first 10 points go together and they're found in verses 4 and 5 and I worked through these last time in my last message. These really, in these verses, Paul wrote of the various hardships he and his fellow workers had to endure serving the Lord. And the testimony was that although he had faced many difficulties, he and his ministry team had patiently endured all of these difficulties and approved themselves as genuine servants of of God. The hardships they had to endure. That's in verses 4 to 10. They were patient. They endured all those hardships. The next 10 points begin in verse 6, where Paul gave, if you like, the manner and the means of his ministry. Firstly, he addresses the manner of his ministry. Paul's ministry team was also approved in the manner of their ministry. This is what, this was, this was, what characterised their ministry. This was a, of what type or kind uh, their ministry was. The qualities we read of here characterised the ministry and showed that they were genuine ministers of God. The first quality mentioned, as I said, is in verse 6. Paul wrote, that they had approved themselves by pureness. Pureness. That's an interesting word. Normally we would put purity, purity. 
It's basically the same thing. Paul wrote that they had proved themselves by pureness. Now this could mean, by this he could have meant their pureness of life. They had pure lives. Uh, but it could also mean that they were pure in their motives, the motives for their ministry. Now sister chapter to this, uh, to this, this chapter is basically 1 Thessalonians 2. I'll quote a few verses from it. In 1 Thessalonians 2.10, the Apostle Paul said, Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Purity characterised their lives when they served the Lord. People were able to say, these are holy men, uh, these are just, they are righteous men, and they, they're unblameable in what they do. Their lives, they had pure lives. Purity characterised their lives, but also their motives. In that same chapter, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 3, Paul said, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. They had pure lives, their message came from pure lives, and also from pure motives. There were no hidden agendas in Paul's ministry. He shared the word of God from pure motives. He wasn't interested in fame or making money at their expense. He wasn't in it for the filthy lucre. There were, there were no impure motives. And so our ministry of the word of God needs to come from pure lives and lips and from pure motives. Can't spend much time on these points. There's still 18 to go. So Paul's ministry was characterised by pureness, but also, in verse 6, by knowledge. By pureness, we were approved as the ministers of God by pureness, by knowledge. To be saved, and that means that God uh, comes and he regenerates your soul. He saves your soul from sin uh, and from, uh, from spending an eternity uh, separated from God. To be saved, for people to have that assurance that they have a home in heaven, to be saved, people need to know some facts. They need to know some facts. Without these facts, they, they can't believe and they can't be saved. For someone to be saved, they have to know some facts so they can believe those facts. And when they believe those facts, God will save them. And so people need knowledge if they are to be saved. Some who claim to be the servants of God draw people through emotional means or through hocus pocus or through sight and sound. Uh, they, ha they, they, they have sort of a feeling of, of godness or something or, or they, they have candles to light or incense to burn but there's no facts, no knowledge about how to be saved. What people need in order to be saved is knowledge. Knowledge about sin, knowledge about God, knowledge about the Saviour. Paul's ministry was pri primarily about sharing knowledge, not the wisdom of man, not mysticism, not emotion, an, emotional, an emotional pull, but the preaching of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. You have to know the facts about the gospel message that Jesus died for our sin, was buried and rose again, and that if we believe in him, we can have sins forgiven. Paul's ministry was about sharing knowledge. And so our ministries, for our ministries to be effective, it must be in knowledge. Our ministries must be in pureness and in knowledge. Hence, we, our pastors are teachers. That's the gift. It's a pastor-teacher. That's someone who imparts knowledge. We have a Sunday school. Uh, that's to do with imparting knowledge. We have a Christian school. We encourage people to have Bible study. All these things involve the imp impartation of knowledge because we know that we need to know some things to be saved and to grow. Peter told us in 2 Peter 3.18 how we are to grow in the Christian life. He said, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. If we're to even grow as Christians, we need knowledge. So our ministry needs to be in knowledge. The manner of Paul's ministry was in pureness, 
in knowledge. And then he went on to say in verse 6, by pureness, by knowledge, and by long-suffering. Now, this one, this uh, aspect or character, is one of the fruit of the Spirit. And it was a mark of Paul's ministry. If you wanted to know something about Paul, he would be someone, and when he served the Lord, who had long-suffering. Now, this simply means uh, not to be easily provoked, uh, and it means to, be, to bear with patience uh, every indignity and affront that might come your way serving the Lord. Not being easily approached, long-suffering, putting up with things that otherwise you might not. In fact, Paul had been incredibly long-suffering to the Corinthians themselves. Uh, they didn't always accept his, uh, accept, uh, his ministry. Uh, they didn't always appreciate all that he had to do, for, all that he had done for them. And they uh, looked too easily to other teachers looking for some, some new thing. And it's a good thing that the, the Corinthians didn't have the internet because they'd always be ser searching for some new fantastic fact, a fact to, to tickle their ears, as people do today. God's word doesn't seem to be enough. They've got to look elsewhere uh, to have... Uh, their ears tickled. Paul had even, even had to defend his ministry to them, even though they were in the faith because of Paul, even though Paul had sacrificed much to come to Corinth and preach the word to them, even though he was the father of their faith, he still had to defend his ministry, and that's why he actually wrote 2 Corinthians. The whole of 2 Corinthians is really Paul defending his ministry to these Corinthians. Have a look in chapter 12, verse 11. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 11. Just the first, a few, just the first clause. First, uh, first, 2 Corinthians 12, 11. I am become a fool in glorying, ye have compelled me. This whole epistle was written to defend his ministry because of the attacks that the Corinthians had made on his ministry. And he says, I've had to glory, I had to boast about what God has done through me because you guys <laughs> compelled me to do it. Paul had been long suffering to this church more than any other church I believe that we know of in the New Testament. But that's what serving the Lord often requires. It requires us to be long suffering. Suffering. Some ministries, in fact, most ministries require a long burn. They require us to be long suffering, to give the Lord time to do his work. We are to be long suffering and let him do his work. That child, one way, who always causes trouble. That school student who hates to learn or be told what to do. Uh, that church member who seems to be negative about just, just about everything. Everything we come up with, they're negative with it. Well, what are we supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to suffer them for a long, as long as it takes for the Lord to work in their hearts. The servant of the Lord needs to be long-suffering if there is to be lasting fruit. But our ministry must also be characterised by kindness. And that was the next next quality that where Paul's ministry was approved and if you go back to 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 6 he said that we have approved ourselves as the ministers of God by pureness by knowledge by long suffering and the next one is by kindness this word is translated gentleness in the Galatians list of the fruit of the spirit Although Paul could stand up in a synagogue and be as tough as old nails, scolding hard heads, his gospel ministry was marked by kindness. I don't know how Paul could go into the, those synagogues and get up and tell them that they'd all, you know, tell them about Jesus being the Messiah and then getting half of the synagogue offside and then virtually splitting the synagogue and starting a church. He had, he had thick skin. He could be as tough as old nails. But when it came to sharing the gospel with those who were unsaved, his ministry was marked with kindness. Paul reminded the Thessalonians that this was also the manner of his ministry to them when, when he took, first took the gospel to their city. In 1 Thessalonians 2.7, 
Paul said, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Paul's ministry to the lost, when he was sharing the gospel with those still unsaved, that ministry was characterized by kindness. When I first went to university, I met some classmates who went to Catholic schools where they were taught by nuns. Now, I don't know if things are the way that this was ancient history, you know, 40 something years ago. But overall, I found that my classmates who'd been taught by these nuns were anti God and anti church because of the harsh treatment by the nuns. There was no kindness in their Christianity. And sadly, over the last few years, gross behaviour has been uncovered in many church denominations to the shame of the Christian church. No kindness in all that child abuse that has occurred in the name of Christ. It's very, very sad. So it's no wonder people are suspicious of Christians and of their message. What the lost need to notice about our ministry is that we are patient and we are kind, and that hopefully will encourage them to listen to the message. And if people do listen to the message, they'll find out that the Lord Jesus Christ himself was gentle and he was kind. In chapter 10 of this very, this very epistle, 2 Corinthians 10, Paul will beseech the Corinthians by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. So kindness should characterise those who minister in his name. If we're going to minister in Christ's name, people need to know that we're kind, we're gentle, we are meek people. Paul's ministry was approved in kindness. But as we go back to our text, he was also approved by the Holy Ghost, in, by pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost. Preposition by here in the Greek is the word and, the little Greek word and, it means in. So the, the, Paul's ministry was characterised in the Holy Ghost. And Paul was telling us here that his ministry was in the Holy Ghost. His ministry wasn't just a human endeavour. endeavor. It wasn't just a carnal pursuit to fulfil some personal goal. You know those people, people tell us we're going to have a dream and we're going to uh, aim to hit that dream and fulfil our, our, our great purpose in life. Well, Paul, it was, it was none of himself. It wasn't all of it he did. had nothing to do with, with anything that came from his, from his own heart. Paul's ministry wasn't, wasn't even coordinated by a mission board. His, his ministry was coordinated by the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit of God empowered him to be the, a gospel preacher and then, had a direct, and then directed him where to go to fulfill his mission. We see an example of what I mean in Acts 16, 7, where Paul was on his first missionary journey. We read there, Paul said, After they were come to Mysia, they said to, go in, said to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. The Holy Spirit wouldn't allow Paul to go north or south. He wanted him to go uh, west. Paul's ministry began by the gifts that the Holy Spirit gave him, and then it was directed where he was to have that ministry. The Acts of the Apostles that we have in our Bible is really the Acts of the Holy Spirit as he ministered through the Apostles. And Paul was an Apostle. And his missionary story fills 15 chapters of Acts and that's not including when he got saved in those earlier chapters of Acts. Much of the book of Acts is simply about how God, the Holy Spirit, used this man, Paul, to bring the Gospel to the Empire. Paul's ministry wasn't in his own strength or his own power to reason. He rested in the strength he received daily from the Holy Spirit within. Paul's ministry was by the Holy Ghost. But it was also characterised by love. And not just love, but by unfeigned love. Have a look in verse 6. By pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love, unfeigned. Now this is the pure love of God and it was without hypocrisy and the Corinthians should have had no doubt what Paul meant by this kind of love because it was to them 
Uh, he had written that great love passage in 1 Corinthians 13. Paul had written to the church three months prior to the second, writing 2 Corinthians, and there he wrote that great love passage, what love, the love of God is. Just, they should have had no doubt as to what Paul meant. And if nothing else, our ministries should be characterised by the love of Christ. His love should constrain us to share the gospel, just as it did Paul. Just flip back there, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because with us judged that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which should live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but live unto him which died for them and rose again. The love of Christ should constrain us to share the gospel and we should share the gospel in love. Love should be the manner and the motive of our ministries. But it should be unfeigned. Paul adds that word there. Uh, to qualify the love, it is to be unfeigned love. Uh, we, we shouldn't bung on the love as we would say in, Australian, in the Australian vernacular. You know, it's easy to say that we love somebody but it's more important to show it. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John 3.18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So it's to be an unfeigned love that should characterise our ministries. So this was the manner of Paul's ministry. But in verse 7 he went on to share what we might call the means of his ministry. What, what is it that empowered his ministry? And so we see there the first one. If we go back to 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 7. By the word of truth. We are approved to be the ministers of God by the word of truth. Paul's ministry was to share the word of truth. Now I think that what he's referring to here is the gospel. So if you'd just like to flip over, it's only a few pages to Ephesians chapter 1. Paul makes a reference to the word of truth in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. Paul said in verse 12 that we should be to the glory, the praise of, the, of his glory of first trusted in Christ, in whom, that's Christ, he also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The word of truth is the gospel of salvation. It's, the, it's that good news message of Jesus dying for our sins, being buried and rising from the dead. It's that good news message, the gospel, that is the word of truth. Paul's ministry was to share the gospel because it is the power of God to salvation. That's what he told the Romans. The gospel was the, Paul, the power Paul depended on to bring light into men's darkness. And we must never wander in our ministries from the gospel. Now I know we have to teach people, we have to know the full counsel of God, but we must never ever wander from preaching the gospel. It must be constantly done in our ministries from the pulpit or in our ministries, wherever we minister for the Lord. People need to hear the word of truth in a world full of lies. They need to hear the gospel, the word of truth. Paul's ministry was approved by preaching the word of truth. But also in verse 7, if you go back to 2 Corinthians 6, his ministry was approved of God by the word of truth, and then he said, by the power of God. Now I think this is a reference to Paul's ministry as an apostle. One evidence Paul's ministry was sanctioned by God was the signs and wonders he performed. If you'd just like to flip over to Romans chapter 15 and he just gives a brief uh, me mention of, of the signs and wonders that he performed as he went from place to preach, place, preaching the gospel as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Romans 15, 18 and 19. Verse 18, for I would not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed through, me, through mighty signs 
and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about until Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. That's one end of the empire. To the other end of the empire, Paul had preached the gospel, but what attended his preaching as an apostle of Jesus Christ were the signs and wonders he performed. How could anyone doubt that Paul was a genuine apostle? He'd been empowered for ministry by the Holy Ghost. But we need to know that God gives spiritual gifts to everyone he saves, not, not just to the Pauls of, of this world. God gives spiritual gifts to everybody. That was the message of 1 Corinthians. He gives spiritual gifts to everyone he saves so that we can all minister in the body of Christ. If you're saved, then he has given you a spiritual gift or spiritual gifts so that you might be able to minister for him in his body. Now, these gifts won't be signs and wonders because they belonged uniquely to the apostolic era. And that's another story. All the true apostles of Christ have died long ago and their gifts with them. But the Holy Spirit still gives gifts to teachers, deacons, exhorters, givers, helpers and others to enable us to serve Jesus Christ in his church. Our ability to serve the Lord should come by the power of God as we exercise our spiritual gifts. But also he goes on in verse 7 to say, but also by the armour of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. They were approved as the ministers of God by these means. They used these means by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armour of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Now the picture here I think is of a Roman soldier. If you know anything of Roman, the way soldier, sol, the Romans are engaged in battle, uh, the two most important things were this, this long rounded shield that they had so they could be in the shield wall and their gladius, their sword. Uh, and, and, and it was like the game of hockey. There are no left-handed uh, hockey, hockey sticks and you couldn't be a left-hander uh, using your sword in the shield wall. You had to always use it in your right hand and so the, 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 uh, the shield would be in the left hand and the gladius in the right hand, the sword. And I think that's the picture that Paul is giving us here of the Roman soldier with his left hand was a shield, his right hand was a sword. And Paul, I think, here is reminding us of the spiritual weapons that we need to wage war, the warfare, the spiritual warfare, which we'll, we'll be, we'll, we will encounter as we serve him. Have a look in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul's going to address this later on. Some of the weapons, the armour uh, of uh, the weapons of war, our spiritual warfare. Verse 3, 2 Corinthians 10. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing it into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they are, but they are mighty through God. These are our spiritual weapons. Paul told the Ephesians about the shield of faith, didn't he? The shield of faith, which is our defence against satanic attack. He told us about the sword of the spirit, which is our offensive weapon. And if our ministry is to be approved, we need to put on the armour of God. But Paul in 2 Corinthians here, he refers to this as the armour of righteousness. He says in verse 7, by the armour of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. So in the exercise of our ministry, we must always do right. Righteousness is simply doing right. We must do right towards God and we must do right towards men. And we must do right, and as that little song tells us, we must do right until the stars fall. If we want to serve the Lord and have his tick of approval, then we need to, we need to bear the armour of righteousness, the armour of righteousness. These were the means of Paul's ministry that are mentioned here in verse 7 by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armour of righteousness. But then Paul went on to mention that his ministry had been approved through different extremes. And uh, that really takes up the next two 
aspects in this list or qualities in this list. And for most of us, our ministry ministries are usually quite even. And we don't encounter the same extremes that Paul encountered. By the time Paul wrote 2 Corinthians, uh, he'd already been serving the Lord for 20 years. And he'd experienced some highs and he'd experienced some lows serving the Lord. But he was still able to have the tick of approval in his ministry. He wasn't a fair weather Christian. He wasn't a fair weather servant. He didn't just, uh, he didn't just go when, for the Lord and, and, and serve the Lord when things were going well and sort of retreat and hide when things weren't going well. He, he just kept serving the Lord through every extreme of ministry. Now, I know my time's run out and I won't sort of share about these things, but I'll just read them. He says in verse, he says in verse 8, By honour and dishonour. There were times when Paul would be honoured and there'll be times when he would be dishonoured by evil report and by good report. Uh, by these, in these uh, two lots of extremes, honour, dishonour, evil report and good report, Paul was able to have the tick of approval. And this tells us that we shouldn't be discouraged when our ministry isn't understood or our ministry isn't appreciated. Sometimes one of the hardest things about serving the Lord is that people don't appreciate what I do. They take me for granted. And so uh, it's, it's, there's some of the low times that we can have. But we shouldn't be discouraged when that happens. But we should praise the Lord when our ministry is appreciated. Let's give God the glory and people under appreciate the things that we do. There will always be highs and lows in serving the Lord, and that's simply because people are involved. And wherever people are involved, it's going to be trials. And people won't always have the right perception of what we do. And that's how Paul finishes this list of 28 characteristics. He gives seven false perceptions that people had of his ministry. And they all begin with the adverb as. He changes his little preposition in and through. He changes it to as. And there are seven pairs of false perceptions. And it begins in verse 8. And I'm just going to read them. We won't have time to comment on them. He says, see where it, it says in verse 8, by honour, by evil report and good report. And then he changes to as. And this tells us there are seven Seven false perceptions that people had. As deceivers, we, people perceived that we were deceivers and yet true. As unknown and yet known. As dying and behold we live. As chastened and not killed. As sorrowful yet always rejoicing. As poor yet making many rich. As having nothing and yet possessing <coughs> all things. Those who serve the Lord aren't always viewed accurately by those outside the ministry. And sadly, some even in the church can misjudge God's servants. And it happens all the time. People will come and say to me about something somebody's done and I'll say, well, wait a minute, have you asked them about it? It's amazing how people have false perceptions even of people within their own church. We need to be careful that we don't fall into making judgments about people that aren't right. But as I was reading through this list, I focused on just one point in verse 9. It says, as unknown and yet well known. Paul may not have been known in the places of power in his day, but he was well known all around the empire in churches. Churches all around the empire knew the name of Paul. And today, his name has been given to thousands of churches worldwide. Right in the heart of London is a magnificent cathedral. It's called St. Paul's. And there are cathedrals, churches, colleges and schools bearing Paul's name all over the world, including Australia. And you can just Google, put St. Paul's into the Google, and so there's one after the other, one after the other. Thousands of them who know the name of Paul. Now, I'm not sure who was the emperor at the time or who was the governor of this province or that I think their names have all been forgotten but Paul's name he is known all around the world to this day we shouldn't worry if the world has the wrong perception of our ministry what should matter is that our ministry is approved by God that is the one whom we're looking for the tick from now I have to admit to you today that I wouldn't receive a tick of approval for some of the points that are listed here in Paul's list. If they applied those to my ministry, I, I, I tell you right now, I will have failed in some areas. 
But this, this list reminds, reminds us of what we need to do, or reminds me of what I need to do to improve. So I won't give offence to the name of Christ. It's a good reminder of what our ministries can be if we're willing to, through being constrained by the love of Christ, not live unto ourselves, but live unto God. I hope everyone here today is safe. I hope you know the Lord Jesus as your saviour. And I hope if you are saved that you are serving the Lord or you're planning to serve the Lord this year. And I hope that your ministry, if you're planning to serve the Lord, I hope that your ministry in God's strength will be, will be approved in all things. That's our goal. It gives us a goal for this year of ministry. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we do thank you so much for the Apostle Paul and for his example to us. And uh, we know that, Father, uh, it was a very hard life. And yet, Lord, the, the blessing of so many souls, one, so many souls, uh, Lord, encouraged and lifted out of, uh, Lord, uh, idolatry and out of, uh, Lord, poverty and so many effects from the gospel ministry of Paul. And, Father, I pray that, uh, that we might be encouraged today to, to, to serve the Lord as, as, as did the Apostle Paul. I, pr I pray that, Lord, we would all be asking, what gift, a spiritual gift, have you given to me? How do you want me to use that gift in the body of Christ? And how can I better serve you that my ministry might be approved? I pray that that might, Lord, be our, our question today. In Jesus' name, amen.